Thank you, Brother Mike. Appreciate that. Take your Bibles this morning, please, and turn with me to the Gospel of Matthew. Matthew chapter number 1, please. Matthew number 1. And we'll begin reading here in just a moment, verse number 18. We are so thrilled that you're here. Christmas Sunday is always a wonderful time at the Cleveland Baptist Church. And we're looking forward not only to this service this morning, but also the one this evening, our Christmas candlelight service. We sure would encourage you to be back tonight, if at all possible. Last Sunday night was phenomenal with the choir and the orchestra putting together their Christmas program. It was just outstanding. And so it's been a wonderful Christmas season here at Cleveland Baptist Church, and we are extremely grateful for it. Uh, if you're able to stand this morning, would you please stand as we read God's Word together? I'll begin reading in verse 18. We'll read down to verse number 25. I want to speak to you this morning on a message I've entitled, The Christmas Miracle, The Miracle of Christmas. The Christmas Miracle, The Miracle of Christmas. Here we are in Verse number 18, now the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise when as his mother Mary was espoused to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Ghost. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man, not willing to make her a public example, was minded to put her away privily. But while he thought on these things, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, Fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. And all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, Behold, a virgin shall be with child, and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. Then Joseph, being raised from sleep, did as the angel of the Lord had bidden him and took unto him his wife and knew her not until she had brought forth her firstborn son and he called his name Jesus. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, it has been a marvelous morning already here at the church house and we're grateful, Father, for the congregating of your people for the meeting of the church. And Father, it is our prayer this morning as we consider the miracle of Christmas that you would help us, Lord, in understanding and receiving truth. Help me, Lord, as I deliver the message. I pray, Lord, I'd say everything I should say and nothing more. And Lord, I pray for these that receive the truth. I pray, Lord, there'd be a receptivity in their heart. And Lord, that is our prayer today, that Christ would be glorified, that he would be lifted up. We're grateful for the blessings. Now bless the preaching, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. you. may be seated. I think it's already been stated perhaps once or twice this morning, but we are certainly looking forward to a great time of celebrating this Christmas. Most of us will gather as family and with friends on Christmas Eve and Christmas Day and have what we call a festive celebration. It's a, probably of all the holidays that we celebrate, Christmas is perhaps my favorite you know, obviously because it is the birthday of Christ, but because of the things that have become tradition in our family and in our home. The day, of course, will be marked in, in our world by businesses being shuttered. Almost everything except ex essential services are closed early on Christmas Eve and all day on Christmas Day. And, and most of us will enjoy a, a wonderful Christmas meal. I hope that you will. And we'll have opening of Christmas presents. Some will set as a family and will open the scriptures and read the story of Christ's coming from the pages of God's Word. And isn't there much to love about Christmas? There's just much to love about this year and this season. Uh, I love the singing of the children. It was mar marvelous this morning to see our first through sixth grade uh, department here this morning singing for us and then to hear Abby sing this morning. And, and I love just the singing of children in our services. And I love the special music of the season. The, the songs that are sung, of course, have a just the tone of the Christmas holiday and about what Christ really means to us. The carols and the songs that are played in public places are something that, to me, I just marvel at. I love the traditions that are associated with this special season, the decorations. Don't you think the church just looks lovely this year? It's just absolutely outstanding, the job that the ladies did in preparing the church house for Christmas. And then, of course, the Christmas trees, the smell of fresh pine, I love uh, freshly baked cookies coming when I walk in the door. I love that smell. It's just, boy, it's just tantalizing. I, I love those moments. And, and a fire that roars in the fireplace. And the waiting for family to arrive from out of town to spend a few days. And so, so think about this. While most everyone celebrates Christmas, I, I suppose there are some that don't. I, I know there's some religions that teach that you shouldn't. 
I don't know why they teach that, but they teach that you shouldn't celebrate Christmas. But most everybody celebrates Christmas. And, but, but there are many that really don't comprehend the great miracle that this day represents. The miracle, of course, is spoken of in this passage. There are some that know about the coming of the Son of God, which is the celebration of this day. That's what it's all about. However, the true miracle of Christmas is something that's not really impacted them. To them, it, this is an event that has happened in history. In other words, the birth of Christ, it happened in history. It's a story to be told, but listen, but not a truth to be embraced. And there's a difference. There's a difference about a story that is told and a truth that is embraced. The miracle, the story, many has reached their heads, but it hasn't transformed their hearts. So I want us to notice in this passage this morning the miracle that is shared in this particular section of Scripture. Notice three particular things that I'll point out to me that are miraculous. First of all, there is the, the special birth that is miraculous. Look at verse number 20 as that birth is spoken of. But while he thought on these things, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. So we think about this, his special birth, that it's miraculous. Uh, when I think about birth, of course, I, I think about the fact that God is the giver of life. I, I hope you understand that today, that God is the giver of life. Now, the God of the Bible our God, the God who's spoken of in the pages of Scripture, is an amazing God. He literally is the only true and living God. Now, there are many that are called gods. In other words, if you look at religions today, specifically certain religions, they, they, they worship a multitude of gods, small g. In other words, they're, they're gods that they are worshipped. But there is only one true and living God. There may be gods that are called gods, but there's only true, one true and living God. And so the, the Bible begins, think about this, the Bible begins with the concept that there is a God. In other words, it's just an assumption. We would go to Genesis chapter 1 and verse number 1, and here's how our Bible starts. In the beginning, God. So in the beginning of time, as far as the world was concerned, there was a God who already was. So before anything was, he was. And the Bible makes this statement about God that we, of course, that we must accept by faith. Now, as a boy, I remember growing up in, in, in church, and I'm thinking to myself, well, you know, I, I, I think about everything. I, at, at, at a point in time, I had a, had, have had a few dogs in my life, and, and so I would realize, okay, there was a time when, when the dog that was my pet came into being, and then there was a time when that dog ceased to be. I, I thought about my family. There were a time when my grandparents, I, as a boy, about, I guess, maybe five or six years old, my grandfather passed away. His first experience with someone close to me that died. And, and so I thought, well, he was, but now he's not. But then the concept of God who always was. A God who has no beginning and no ending. That's hard for a person who has a beginning and, and ending to comprehend, to wrap your mind around it. But you must accept that fact by faith that God is. And so when we think about the fact that God is, we, we understand that he has no beginning. He's without end. He is perpetual, eternal life. Listen, God is more than energy. He is a person. He has attributes. He's perfect. He's totally good and completely holy and righteous. He is sovereign, which means he's above all things. There is nothing that God is subservient to. Everything is subservient to this one who is called God. This, God we're this is the God we're talking about. He has written about himself in the pages of this book. Now let me help you understand this concept of God by a, an illustration that we find of him in the pages of Scripture. We don't have time to turn there, but I'm just going to mention it in, in our, our passing here today. We, we all perhaps remember the name Moses. And understand that Moses, of course, became a great leader of the nation of Israel. He was the one that God sent to send his, set his people free from Egyptian captivity. They had been held for 430 years, so generation after generation had been held in captivity. But when we look at how God was worked in Moses' life to get him to the point where that he had the boldness and the courage to go confront Pharaoh, it's a very interesting story. Moses, of course, for 40 years has kept the flocks of his father-in-law, Jethro, on the backside of a desert. And so he's been content to be a shepherd. He's keeping the sheep one day, and he's up on a mountain, and all of a sudden there's something that catches his attention. The Bible says that he saw a bush. Listen, he saw a bush that was on fire, 
but it wasn't consumed. Now, if you know anything about fire, you have to understand that in order for fire to exist, it has to have fuel. In other words, no fire can go on unless there's something that is given to it to feed it. So whether it's uh, some sort of accelerant, gasoline or kerosene or some other uh, explosive type of energy or some wood or or something that is, is combustible, fire can't exist. And yet Moses saw a bush that had fire on it, but the fire, it, but, but the bush itself wasn't consumed. And from that bush, God spoke. And God spoke to Moses. And, and so Moses is, is intrigued by this, this fire on a bush, but the bush isn't. In other words, the fire is existing, but it doesn't really need the, bu- the, the bush to exist. So as God is going through this process with Moses, and he says to Moses, Moses, look, I'm sending you before Pharaoh to set my people free. And, and Moses is just intrigued because he's heard of the gods of his fathers, but he doesn't know much about him. He says, God, when I go before your people, they're going to ask me this question. What is your name? And God said, you tell them that I am has sent you. I am? Well, in the Hebrew, that's Jehovah. That's his name, Jehovah. It means that he was, that he is, and that he always will be. In other words, he doesn't need anything. He doesn't need you. He doesn't need me. He doesn't need food. He doesn't need sleep. He never gets a day older. He's always the same. He was, he is, and he always shall be. And so when I think about that, I think to myself of of this particular story. I, I find here that Obviously, God is, is amazing, as I said in, a moment ago. And so we think about the first being that was put here on this planet. His name is Adam. We read about him in the book of Genesis. Now, you can believe evolution if you want to, but I choose to believe the Bible. And, and I believe that what God says in the Bible, that God created this world in six little old days. On the sixth day, God says, okay, I've created this, 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 per, this, this planet for a purpose, that purpose is to bring glory to me. And the way I'm going to receive glory is through a creation called a man. And so God comes from heaven himself and forms man out of the dust of the earth. So, so I want you to think there's a body there. He's not been conceived. He's been created. He's been made. And then God breathes into that man's nostrils the breath of life. And that man becomes a, the Bible says, a living soul. From that man, the Bible says that God took a part of man and makes a woman, we call her Eve. The name Adam means red earth. He was made from the earth. God said, you're made from the earth, and from the earth you shall return at a point. But he takes uh, a part of man, makes a woman, brings them together, and guess what, folks? Every one of us come from them. You're related. I want you to look at the person to the left of you, the person to the right to you, and say, hey, welcome to the family, all right? You're part of the family today. You are in his family. You are in the family of man. You came from Adam. So we understand that all of us got here by conception. A man and a woman. By God's design, God says a man and a woman marry and they have children. I got here because my parents got married and had me. Now your parents may have had you and they may not have been married, but Again, by God's design, God says, look, people should marry and have children. I'm not going to elaborate that today, but I'm just simply saying we all got here because a man and a woman came together and there was a conception. That is history. But there is one exception. It's the exception that we find here in our passage. I find that this birth of Jesus Christ is the exception. Notice that this is the most unusual of all births. Think about this. This is the most unusual of births. Our texts were introduced to a man by the name of Joseph. And, and Joseph is engaged, or we, the Bible uses the word espoused or betrothed to a woman by the name of Mary. They have not yet had a physical relationship. I explained a, a week or two ago about, about the way the betrothal, espousal relationship worked. And there was no physical relationship. They could be legally bound to this contract, but until he took her to his home, there was going to be no physical relationship. So he's in this betrothal, this espousal with this woman, and all of a sudden it's told to him, look, she's not, she's, she's with child. Now I got news for you guys. I'd be suspicious. If I know I'm not the daddy, there got to be somebody's the daddy, right? I mean, that's what it comes down to. So 
Joseph says, well, what am I going to do about this? That's why the Bible says he was minded to put her away privily. In other words, he said, you know, she's been unfaithful. I'll just, I'll write her a bill of divorcement. I'll, I'll put her away. I don't, I don't want to make a public spectacle. I want to put her on display. I don't want to make a big deal about this, but I'll just put her away. But notice what the Bible says there in verse number 20. While he's thinking on these things. By the way, guys, don't ra act rashly in life. You need to think about things. You need to ponder some things. And so he's pondering something. What does he ponder? Well, as he's pondering, the angel Gabriel shows up. He says, Joseph, don't be afraid to take her to be your wife. Because that which is done in her is the work of the Holy Spirit. This is the most unusual of all births. So I think about the, the miracle, the miracle of his birth. It's, it, it's marvelous that God the Holy Spirit has done this. So I want you to notice number two. Now the second miracle that we find here, the miracle of God becoming a man is miraculous. Look at verse 23. Behold, a virgin shall be with child and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. God with us. Now, there are prohibitions that we find in the Bible about God. God is quite clear in the Old Testament that, he, that we, you better be careful how you deal with him. I mean, his name is, is something that we need to be very protective of. This idea of taking his name in vain is something God says, look, you, you don't do that. We oftentimes just you get just a little bit flippant just because of the way our society is. And somebody will make the statement, oh, God. Can I tell you that's a, that's a prohibition in the Bible? We, we ought not to say that. And so God is very, very protective about his name. And he, and, 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 and he was very protective about anything physical that someone would make in relation to worship of him. Let, let me read for you, if you want to turn there very quickly, Exodus chapter 20. I'm going to read to you verses 1 through 5. If you know anything about Exodus 20, there's what we call the Ten Commandments. When in the Ten Commandments, of course, God gives us the first four deal with his our relationship with him. He's saying, here are things I want you to know about me and how you're supposed to respond to me. And so verse number one, the Bible says, And God spake all these words, saying, I am the Lord thy God, which hath brought thee out of the land of Egypt and out of the house of bondage. Listen, thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image of any likeness of anything that is in the heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them nor serve them. For I am the Lord thy God, am jealous, a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me. So, so think about this. Israel as a nation was in this covenant relationship with God, the, the true and living God. And though he was invisible, he was real. Moses saw a manifestation of him on a, on a bush that was on fire but wasn't consumed. As they are led through the wilderness, the Bible says that God manifested himself in this pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. So this was manifestation. But there, in, in a sense, there wasn't anything, there, there wasn't this physical body or, or there wasn't some God of, of wood or stone that they were to make that they were to bow down to. So God was very, very careful about that. They were, they were, this nation was blessed and protected as long as they obeyed and worshipped their God properly. However, when they left their God and they found themselves bowing before other gods... And they did that. If you look at their history, they did that. And whenever they did, did that as a nation, they found themselves in trouble. God took down his hedges, he removed his hand of protection, and he brought judgment to bear upon them because they weren't worshiping him. They weren't worshiping him. So, here, as a result of that, the nation of Israel is this, if I can use this, this anomaly in the world. An anomaly means that they're just... So different. There's nothing else kind of like that. In other words, if you'd go from nation to nation, you'd find that all these nations were bowing down before these shrines of gods. But Israel has no shrine to bow down to. They have no God that they're bowing before. There's no likeness that they're bowing before. One author that I wrote, read about this week said it this way, the Hebrews had such an exalted conception of God that they didn't even make an image of him, something which so amazed the Roman conquerors. So when Rome came in, the conquerors, they dubbed them atheists, People without gods. That's how they looked upon. They didn't have a God. So we understand that God had given these prohibitions, but think about this. The statement uh, is made here in verse number 23. 
Emmanuel, call us, he shall be called Emmanuel, which is God with us. God is with us. So it is, the true and living God did something much more amazing than some petty little image of wood or stone or steel. I, I want you to think about that. So, so all these nations, they make these, these icons, so to speak, that people bow before. Some, some guy who's really good with, the, with, with, a, a, with a wood chisel and a hammer, man, he beats out this image of a God. And so people bow before. This is our God. We worship him. We worship him. Somebody else, perhaps a metal worker, he's, he works with metal and he throws it in the fire and brings out this metal and they've got this God and man, it may be beautiful, it may be covered with gold and they're just enthralled with it. That's, that's amazing. But Israel has no image. Their God hasn't, doesn't have an image. But God does something much more amazing than that. God steps out of heaven and puts himself in a fleshly human body like we have. God was with us. He lived here. I love what the Bible says in the book of John, chapter 1, verse 14. The word, the word speaking of God, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. The idea that God took upon him his, his infinite greatness, what I call a tenement of clay. God dwelt in physical form and lived and walked among his people. Someone said it's a miracle that God became a man without ceasing to be God. What a miracle. This child conceived whose birthday we celebrate was God in the flesh. There that night in the stable, lying in a feeding trough of animals, filled with fresh hay, laid the Son of God, the, the Lord God, this, this tiny, helpless, vulnerable child was God in the flesh. He had been born into our world. To be sure, Christ veiled his Glory in a fleshly tabernacle, but the Bible clearly states this child was God with us. The Son of God was born. That's a miracle. Well, let me give you the last miracle, and we'll be finished this morning. I think there's the miracle of the purpose of this birth. It was miraculous. Look at verse number 21, please. And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name. Say it. Say it again. She'll bring forth a son and call his name Jesus. Why? His name is called Jesus because he shall save his people from their sins. The name, his name, Jesus. It's the Greek form of the Hebrew name Joshua. Most of us would be familiar with that Joshua of the Old Testament who was, the Bible says, was Moses' minister, his servant, so to speak, his understudy. Did you know prior to Joshua's name being Joshua, it was Hosea? And it simply means Savior. That name Hosea meant Savior. But it is believed after he had the victory with the Amalekites that Moses renamed him. Do you remember that story about they were there in the wilderness, the Amalekites came after them, and, and, and Joshua took some of the children of Israel and they went to battle against the Amalekites. And, and Moses is up on the mountain with the rod of God. And as long as he held the rod up in his hand, Joshua was victorious. But when his hand got heavy and it dropped, uh, the, the, the Amalekites began to make uh, inroads against the, the Israelites. And so Aaron and Hur stood with Moses and lifted up his arm. And as long as the arm was lifted up and the rod of God was lifted up, Joshua had victory. And so he got a victory that day because God gave him a victory. And so they said, we're going to change your name from Savior to God is our Savior. And so when we come to the New Testament, we understand that God says, look, I want my son to be called Jesus. The Greek form of the Hebrew word Joshua. It's interesting to me that we're told in Luke chapter 1, verse 31, that the angel Gabriel appeared to Mary before, as he's announcing to her that she's going to be the one that will bear this child into the world. And she said his, he said to her, when he is born, his name shall be called Jesus. Here in our text, we find Joseph is instructed that this child, when he's born, is to be called Jesus. Why? Because he shall save his people. This Jesus shall save his people from his sins. I want you to look at verse 21, because this is very important that you get a hold of this. Look at it, it says, for, uh, call his name Jesus. Notice, for he shall save his people from their sins. My understanding is, in the way that this is written, is that the he here is emphatic. What do you, you say, what do you mean by that? Well, here's what I mean by that. It means that in the emphatic, that he alone shall save his people. In other words, there isn't many saviors. There's not several saviors. There's only one savior. His name is Jesus. There is another na name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. His name is Jesus because he shall save his people from their sins. I want you to see that he saves his people by giving his own life. 
We think about salvation. It can only be attained from God through the meeting of his holy demands. People do all kinds of things today to be, think that they're going to get themselves saved. They'll do all kinds of works to think that somehow, some way, they're going to merit an acceptance before the God of heaven. But I want you to know the Bible states with us and shares with us that the man, this man Adam, who we mentioned a few moments ago, brought a curse and a problem into this world through his sinful disobedience. While God created him in, in, in perfection and in innocency, without any taint of sin, when he was tempted, the Bible says that he gave in to the temptation and by that disobedience plunged our world into a, a world of difficulty. That simple act of disregarding God's clear instruction brought upon our world a lot of pain and suffering. Can I, can I help you understand that ultimately it doesn't end in this life? In other words, while there's a lot of pain, I, I talk to people all the time, and I'll, I'll, when I'm witnessing to them, I said, you know, the Bible teaches their hell, and I have people say to me this, I say, preacher, listen, I'm living in hell right now. And there are a lot of people, I, I, don't, I won't disagree, there are a lot of people that are going through a lot of difficulty in life, and there is a lot of discomfort and, and pain and suffering in life. But I, wanna, I want you to know something, and I tell them too, I'm, I'm just going to say, look, as difficult as your life may be, this is not hell. Because there is still a hell that's coming. That is the ultimate payment of our sin. The Bible is clear that in the wages of our sin is death. It means that I will die, and then I will die. That's what I deserve, is separation not only from my flesh, my, my soul from my, and spirit from my body, but then separation from the presence of God in a place called hell. That is the payment. So if somebody says, well, how do I fix it? How do I keep myself from going to hell? How, how, do, I, how, do, I, how do I not go there? I want to tell you, you have to be absolutely insane to want to go to hell. You, you'd have to be without your senses. There are people that say, well, I, you know, I, I think I'm going to go to hell. They, they mock it. They ridicule it as if it doesn't exist. I'm here to tell you, friend, hell is real today. You say, how do you know? Because the Bible says so. And because God sent his son into this world. So somebody says, well, how do I fix it? Can I help you understand it? You can't fix it yourself. This church can't fix it. This preacher can't fix your problem. I can tell you about the one who can fix your problem. His name is Jesus. You see, because the wages of sin is death and if I don't pay for my own sin, someone would have to pay for that. And that someone would have to be, have no sin of their own. And that's why when we think about this miraculous supernatural birth, this Christ coming, that he had, had no human physical father because God had to prepare a body that wasn't tainted by the curse and the problem of sin. And so Jesus is born into this world for the purpose of dying. He came to die. He came to die for your sin, friend. The Bible says he tasted death for every man. When he hung upon the cross of Calvary, I want you to think about every sin that you've ever committed. He already paid for it. He made payments sufficient for it. Now look, it's not, it, it won't work for you until you're willing to turn from that sin and receive his forgiveness. You have to make a credible, cognizant, spirit-filled, spirit-led decision to say, you know what, I am a sinner. I can't save myself. I can't fix my problem. My church can't fix it. My preacher can't fix it. My mama can't fix it. My daddy can't fix it. Nothing can fix it but Jesus. And I'm willing to turn from that sin and come to him, bow my knee, humble my heart, and say, Lord Jesus, I know why you came. You came to die for me. For me. For me. I'm so glad, as a five-year-old child, I sat in a church, this very church, not in this auditorium, but an old auditorium, and I heard a preacher speak about Jesus Christ and how he could forgive my sin. Now look, as a five-year-old, I wasn't an ax murderer. I hadn't done drugs or alcohol or hadn't been immoral. But I was still a sinner nonetheless. I had a sin problem within me that I couldn't fix myself. But I'm so glad I heard about Jesus. And the miracle of new birth took place in my life some 55 years ago when I trusted Christ as my Savior. And do you know that decision has so impacted my life that has 
develop me and help me through my life so that I stand before you today as a preacher of the gospel of Jesus Christ. It is a miracle. It is a miracle. He came to save you from your sin. That's the miracle of Christmas. That little babe laying in a manger, really in some respects was laying in the shadow of a cross because that was his destiny. The Lamb of God had been born to take away the sin of the world. I read this the other day. I thought I'd end my message with it this morning. Listen to it. A baby's hand in Bethlehem were small and softly curled, but held within their dimpled grasp the hope of all the world. What a, what a statement. That little child was the hope of all the world. I hope it's your hope this morning. Would you bow?